Okay, nice to see you all here this evening. Dodged a few rain showers once again, just a few sprinkles, so we made her through it. How about turning to hum hymn number 115 as we consider how our Lord suffered and died on that cross so many years tonight. Ivory palaces. always her requested song. She sit right over there. And she's a nice, dear, sweet lady, always requested that song. What a beautiful song. Anyway, in terms of announcements, they're pretty basic. Tuesday morning, men's prayer time here at the church at 8.30 a.m. Of course, we have prayer and Bible study on Wednesday night, as well as the youth group meeting downstairs. Mommy and Me continues on, on seven, at 10 o'clock a.m. on Thursday. And of course, our regular Sunday services remain the same, 10 o'clock for Sunday school, morning worship immediately following, and of course, the 6 p.m. service that we are in now. We're having a monthly business meeting immediately following our prayer meeting this Wednesday night. And minutes are available on request. If for some reason you aren't there and you can't make it, just ask and they'll make sure that you get your copy of the minutes. Anyone interested in helping New Life Bible Camp cut firewood? Tomorrow's the big day, 11 o'clock, uh, 11th. You should see Pastor Zach, get down there if you can, and that's hard.
hard work, but what a wonderful thing it is to be able to help in such a wonderful ministry. Of course, the cleaning schedule and nursery schedules are in the bulletin. I know of no other announcements at, particular, at this particular time. Before Pastor comes to speak, though, let's turn to number 118. When I survey the wondrous cross. Good evening. Good to see you here tonight, and I'm going to ask if you can turn with me to Joshua chapter 3. Joshua chapter 3, we're going to uh, continue our series in Joshua, and then we will uh, come back and sing another hymn before we observe the Lord's table together this evening. Joshua chapter 3, and we are going to pick up the reading in verse 1. And we will be looking through the whole chapter. It's a shorter chapter than this morning. You'll be glad to hear. Um, but Joshua chapter 3 and verse 1. And we're just going to read down to verse 6 for the time being. And Joshua rose early in the morning, and they removed from Shittim and came to Jordan, he and all the children of Israel, and lodged there before they passed over. And it came to pass after three days that the officers went through the host, and they commanded the people, saying, When you see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God, and the priests, the Levites, bearing it, then you shall remove from your place and go after it. Yeah, there shall be a space between you and it, about 2,000 cubits by measure. Come not near unto it, that you may know the way by which you must go. For you have not passed this way heretofore. And Joshua said unto the people, Sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. And Joshua spake unto the priests, saying, Take up the Ark of the Covenant, and pass over before the people. And they took up the Ark of the Covenant, and went before the people. And we'll end the reading there. Let's just pray, and we'll seek the Lord. Father in heaven, we thank you for this night. We thank you for your word, and, and again for this wonderful illustration of faith. We pray that you would do a work in our hearts as we consider it together this evening. And this I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 
When we come to Joshua chapter 3, we find this new generation, a new generation in contrast to the generation that had stood on the, the shores of Jordan 40 years previous, and through a lack of faith and then through allowing their fears to dominate them, they turned back and for 40 years wandered in the wilderness. So this is a new generation who are going to take those pioneering steps of faith toward the new land. And as we give a focus on faith and thinking about what it means for us, consider what it means in verse 4, where he talks about the Ark of the Covenant preceding everyone, and he tells them, it's because you haven't passed this way before. You're going somewhere new. You're going to do something new, and you need to make sure that you are following God. And God calls on us to follow Him with that same pioneering, courageous faith. Sometimes it'll be a simple faith to step out and, and do something we're uncomfortable with. Other times it may be something big and bold that really needs, uh, you know, a true spirit of a pioneer. Uh, but whatever the case may be, uh, we want to learn what we can from Joshua chapter 3 and be willing to follow wherever the Lord may lead. So first of all, we're going to think about verse 1 and skip down to verses 7 or eight, seven and 8 and consider uh, the uh, lesson we can learn from Joshua and, and see how he drew strength for the day. He knew he needed strength for that day. We spent a lot of time considering how Joshua was prepared for his life's calling. And that's something which very often we encourage for young people. For young people as they go through their, their childhood years, into their teens, and even into their early 20s, they're still, to a large degree, preparing for the rest of their life. And so we looked how that was the case with Joshua and how God prepared him and, and just helped him be ready for the calling upon his life. But he also prepared to serve the Lord each day. Look what it says there in verse 1. Joshua rose early in the morning. And then if we skip down to verses 7 and 8, the Lord said unto Joshua, This day will I begin to magnify thee in the sight of all Israel, that they may know that as, as I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. And I shall command the priests that bear the ark of the covenant, saying, When you are come out to the brink of the water of Jordan, you shall stand still in Jordan. Two things to take note of. Joshua prepared himself for the day by meeting with the Lord, and he communicated with the Lord. He heard from God. He responded to Him in prayer. And those who hear from the Lord are those who are disciplined to spend time in the Word and in fellowship. You know, it's, it's a, a simple solution in, in many ways. If we speak to someone and they say, well, I just don't feel like the Lord's speaking to me. Well, is your Bible always looking like that? Yes. Well, here's the solution. Now the Lord will speak to you. Now, it may be sometimes we open the Bible and we read it for five minutes and, and a verse jumps out. It's like there's a, a, you know, something being highlighted and we're blessed by it. Other times I understand we may read for 10, 15, 20, 30 minutes and, and maybe we have to stop and then come back at a later date. I realize that sometimes, you know, it takes some time in the Word to glean something from it. But if you want to hear from God, it starts by opening the Bible and reading His Word. And Joshua took the time to meet with the Lord. Now, you know, I'm, I'm definitely an advocate for being an early riser. You know, Joshua here, it says, it says he rose early in the morning. And that can be a subjective term. I get it. You know, for some people, early may be 10 a.m. And, you know, some people early may be 5 a.m. You know, for others working shifts, you don't have early in the same kind of uh, scheme as others may do. Early for you, if you're starting a night shift at 9 p.m., then you may get up at, you know, 5 p.m. So whatever, you know, if you've got a night shift, I understand there's different, um, you know, schedules that people have. But I think there's definitely something about being an early riser and, and giving something to the Lord at the beginning of the day. And, and like I said, I'm not, you know, preaching that it's Bible truth that you have to get up at 5 a.m. But, you know, what works for you to give time to the Lord before anything else? 
It describes Joshua here in chapter 3, verse 1, rising early. Uh, then also in chapter 6 and verse 12, it says Joshua rose early in the morning. Uh, when you go over to chapter 7, verse 16, it says that Joshua rose up early in the morning. And there's at least one other passage in Joshua where we see the same. It was his habit. He was his schedule. And again, I won't stand up here and preach, you have to have a routine, but it does seem to be the case that routine helps people. Amen. You know, uh, we, we want to make sure that we are deliberate in the way that we live our lives. Um, I'm, I'm terrible for not being spontaneous, because some people like that. They like some spontaneity every now and again. I have to plan my spontaneity. I have to schedule it in advance, and otherwise it just doesn't work for me. But you look at Joshua, and he had a routine, he had a schedule, and the advantage with that is it puts you in control of your life to a degree. And so, as much as is possible, if we say, you know what, I want to give some time to the Lord every day to prepare for the day, whether your day starts at 5 a.m. or 5 p.m. or somewhere in between, take control of it, because if you don't, then the enemy will, or just the busyness of life will. As much as is possible, and let me emphasize that, as much as is possible. You know, we had a point in our lives when we had, I think, three children, kind of four and under, or something like that, three, three and under. And it felt like we had very little control of our lives. Kids are genius. Their ability to communicate at the earliest stages, whereby they would somehow know that number one was going to be asleep between like 9 and 11, and then that one would fall asleep, and the next one would wake up and be awake between 11 and 1. Well, then the first two would fall asleep, and then the third one would wake up and be awake between 1 and 3, and it's like they planned it. And you know, at that stage in your life, you may feel like, how can I take control of this? I'm just going to do what I can when I can. But the point is this, Joshua rose up early and he gave time to the Lord. Give time to God. If you want to hear from him, you need to take the time to be with him. And I think on a very practical level, if you don't plan it and schedule it, it's a lot less likely that this is going to happen. Moses is the same thing. Moses 24 and then Moses chapter, th uh, Moses, book of Moses, book of Exodus 24, the book of Exodus 34. It describes Moses rising up early. David in Psalm 57 talks about preceding the night watches. So before that final watch would get up and, and would begin into their watch, David got up to worship the Lord. And Jesus, it describes numerous times in the gospel, he rises up a great while before day. Whatever it takes for you to give time to God before you have to do something else, there is a consistent example of that all the way through the Word. So Joshua, to get strength for the day, needed to go to the one who had strength. In verse 7, we see the Lord speaking to Moses, and then God is going to speak to us through His Word. The Lord says unto Joshua, This day will I begin to magnify thee in the sight of all Israel. Why was God going to do that? Why was God going to magnify Joshua? Well, it was to show to the people, I'm with Joshua as I was with Moses. Why did the people need to know that Joshua was the new leader? Well, it was so that they would follow Joshua. They needed to know that Joshua was the one, you know, we, we don't often think of Joshua in these terms, but he was a prophet. He received instruction from God and he gave it to the people. And, you know, Joshua needed to be trusted and followed because what God wanted to do through Joshua and the people would glorify God. So ultimately, we bring it back to this. God was going to magnify Joshua so that God would be glorified. You know, don't be afraid of God doing something in your life. God may bring some promotion into your life, and not promotion simply in terms of, of a vocation, but He may give you some kind of platform or voice or influence or some kind of opportunity that kind of moves you out into the forefront of something, and He may do that so you can glorify Him. And we can think of examples of, of maybe sports personalities or actors or politicians who found themselves with a voice, a platform, and they used that to help others, and they used it to glorify God. God said to Joshua, I'm going to magnify you, but it was so ultimately God could be glorified himself. 
Let God work in your life. Don't be afraid of a time when the Lord may say to you, I want you to do this for me. And it's going to take pioneer in faith. It's going to take us saying, well, Lord, I'm uncomfortable with that. But if that's what you want me to do, I'll obey. There are more pastors I've spoken to than you might realize who would say that they're actually very shy that they're actually very you know nervous about speaking in front of crowds and yet kind of like Moses God says okay if that's what you're uncomfortable with then let's get you doing that uh, the one of the pastors I knew growing up he was a teacher of mine in uh, Sunday in uh, Bible college and I uh, went to his church for two or three years and his name is David Moore and from the pulpit he seems to be the most bold and and you know completely without any timidity or shyness or whatever and yet he would say often that he actually is very shy that he gets very nervous speaking in front of people the God may say something to you not necessarily in the context of preaching although he might but he may say to you I want you to do this for me and you know, when God moves us out of our comfort zones, what does that do? It, it glorifies him. We're going to see later on uh, that God promised that the children of Israel would see wonders. What does it take for a wonder to, to take place? Well, it needs something impossible. Something is, is wonderful. It's full of wonder to us when we can't explain it and we can't give any kind of human reason for it. But when do we get into opportunities like that? Well, those are opportunities for God to, to be glorified through our discomfort, through our perhaps lack of, of confidence in a situation. And it can be as simple as God saying, go and give a track to that individual. As you go through the grocery store and it's simply saying, hey, here's something to read later. And some people do that without a second thought for other people. It makes them very nervous. But if God gives you a, a command to do that, he's going to give you the grace to obey. Joshua followed the Lord. When you look in verse 8, he says, Thou shalt command the priests. The opportunities where we may find ourselves in a position to give commands are probably going to be rare. But we can still lead through influence. We can still lead through giving a good example. Joshua here is exemplifying faith so that we can be informed and encouraged and, and live lives of pioneering faith as well. Well, if we continue in verse 1 and, and down to verse 6, I want you to look at the, the prepara preparation for the people. Joshua needed to draw strength for the day, as do we. But the nation needed to prepare as well. In the remainder of verse 1, it says that they prepared to remove from where they'd encamped in Shittim, and they came to Jordan, he and all the children of Israel, and lodged there before they passed over. Think of the pioneer in faith, the courageous faith that we've seen so far, the faith of a leader, Joshua, in chapter 1. You know, and God comes to him and, and tells him that he'd follow on from Moses, and he instructs him to not let the, the word of, of the Lord depart out of his mouth. He told him to be brave and courageous, and we kind of expect that in Joshua because his whole life it's been leading that way well we come to Joshua chapter 2 and we find Rahab who seems to be the least likely individual in, in human terms that God would, would take and, and would make an example of faith and put into the earthly lineage of our Savior himself and yet we see that pioneering faith of uh, Rahab well, now we're going to see the courageous faith of not just the leader and, and not just a single individual in the city of Jericho, but the whole nation is going to have to take a step of faith. They go up from where they'd encamped and they move towards Jordan. Just a, a short journey, just a, you know, a, a few uh, miles or so, if that far, and they move towards the river's edge in preparation to cross over. That may have been, in some ways, the step that made the difference to the rest. It was the first step on the journey. Because as soon as they packed up, remember this is a camp of some millions, perhaps. And it's, it took time to pack everything up. 
So to pack it all up, it meant they were going somewhere. And then to go and stand on the river's edge, well, that meant they were going to have to go the rest of the way. And Jericho was within distance that they could see the nation of Israel active and busy. And everything gets packed up. And then they start marching towards them. And Jericho maybe still thought it was a joke and looked and said, well, what are they going to do? Just stay by the river? But they took a step of faith. When they got up and they moved from this original encampment, they had to believe that God was going to make a way for them to get through the river. And they would have heard stories of their parents crossing the Red Sea out of Egypt, but many of them would have been either too young to remember or perhaps weren't even born yet. Remember, this was a new generation who had not been in Egypt. If we, just for a moment, go over to Hebrews chapter 6. In verse 1, God wants us to grow in our faith. He wants us to take steps to move beyond our original point of salvation. He says, therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptism, the laying on of hands and resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. He says, let us go on. You know, we read often of Paul and Peter speaking of growing in grace and knowledge. Let's go on. Let's move beyond. You know, it's wonderful when we come to, to, to God for salvation through Jesus Christ. But we need to go on. We haven't really talked about it too much, but I would contend that Jordan isn't meant to be a picture of death entering into heaven, but Jordan is a picture of the new life and entering into the Christian life. Because what happens when we, when we die and we cross into heaven, we go to a place of rest. But did Joshua rest when he crossed? He entered into a place of battle where there were still victories to be won. And so I see here very much a picture, very much a symbol of the initial place where we find ourselves as coming to God for salvation through Christ. And then we cross over into the victory, into the, the, the life that God has for us as believers, into uh, the situation where Israel would find themselves of needing to win battles by the grace of God and for victories to be claimed. God has saved us to make soldiers out of us in his battle. Israel had been brought out of Egypt. He'd been brought, they'd been brought out, but not just to wander in the wilderness. Israel had been brought out of Egypt so that they could go into the promised land. And for us, you know, God has brought us out of our sin and he's brought us out of our spiritual death so that he could bring us into the battle that he would have for us to fight. Ephesians 2 and verse 10 talks about our salvation and it talks about the works that we've been foreordained to. Now, I don't believe that we are predestinated beyond our control to become saved. I believe in the free will that we have, that God's given to us, that when the gospel is offered to us, then we choose to believe or, or not to believe. But what I do know is it says after that, God has a plan for you and we're foreordained to good works. Well, God has given us uh, something to do for Him. I want you to consider what this moment was like for Joshua when he tells them to gather up their things, to prepare to enter into the land. Forty years ago, Joshua stood with Caleb and with Moses and said, we can go into the land. God is going to give us the victory. And the entire nation stood against them. And for 40 years, Joshua had to wander in the wilderness along with all of the rebels. Do you think there was a day when maybe Joshua and Caleb and Moses were sat together and they said, you know what, it didn't have to be this way. We could be in the land of milk and honey. And here we are in a dusty desert, eating manna again. <laughs> Good, quail's back on the menu. You know, they, they went back into the wilderness. And, and do you think there was a struggle maybe with bitterness? For Joshua and Caleb and the others to maybe look at the rest of the nation and say, you know what? 
I could have been living my life in the promised land. And because of you, I'm out here in the desert. Whether there were days like that, I don't know. But I know when it came down to it that Joshua had to have won big victories over bitterness. Victories over the, the feeling that somehow a bit of his life had been robbed by others. Joshua had to move forward into the promised land. When the time came, God said, okay, the victory is now. I wonder about the heartache that maybe Joshua felt when he looked. And, and you know, that there are estimates, and, and I won't go into the exact numbers now, but they estimate, you know, the maximum number that there could have been of the children of Israel running into some millions. And if that many died over the period of those 40 years in the wilderness, how many, you know, hundreds would have been just dropping dead in that time of travel? And I wonder how often he maybe looked and he said, didn't have to be that way. And now Joshua, finally, he must have trusted the Lord. He must have received the grace of God. He must have received the help and the comfort of God in order to come to this place. And when God said, now is the time, he says, okay, well, I've, I was ready. And I've been ready. And he was prepared to enter into the land. And Joshua, it seems like he obeyed immediately. When God spoke to him and told him that it was time, Joshua passed the word along and he told the people, sanctify yourselves for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. I have to wonder if maybe he got a little bit impatient even. If maybe he was like 40 years and we've got to wait one more day, can't we do it now? You know, if you've never had that excitement about doing something for the Lord, then, you know, I would encourage you, you know, get before God and, and have a desire to be so excited about doing something for the Lord that it feels like waiting until tomorrow is too long. Obedience doesn't delay. They moved to Jordan. They packed up. They moved. It was something like 10 miles across to, to the river. The command there was that there would be uh, 2,000 cubits, which is about 3,000 feet. I think there was three reasons for that that I could think of. Number one, everyone could see it. You can't follow what you can't see. Isn't that true? And so there was a space given so that everybody could see where they were meant to go. But it also emphasized that God was leading the charge. They didn't get all of the men and line them up at the front and give them whatever weapons they were able to get their hands on and prepare for a military invasion of the land. This was a spiritual battle. The ark was symbolical, symbolical, the, the symbolical of the presence of God. It contained the law, and it was the focal point for the sacrifices. It reminded the nation that they were in a covenant relationship with the promise-keeping God. And so when that ark went ahead, they were able to think, well, God said he's going to do something, and we choose to believe. It was the fulfillment of a promise. I think the third reason why the ark was put at the front was that it reminded them that although God was with them, he was to be revered. We want to be close to God without taking him for granted. We want to have a familiarity with him, but not a familiarity that descends into a kind of contempt. He's not our buddy. You know, he's God. He's to be revered, and we want to make sure that we get close to him, but also remember that he is almighty God. That there is this element of, of, of this respectful reverence and fear that we keep. Uh, one of the ways that the people were to prepare themselves in verse 5, he says, Sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders. Sanctify yourselves. Again, the emphasis here is not that there was going to be a spiritual or a, a, a physical encounter with swords and shields, but it was spiritual. Canaan, when you look at historical records and archaeology and different things, it seems like Canaan had become a headquarters for idol and demon worship in the world. But there are things in, in the, the spiritual realm that we can't fully understand, and we saw this with Revelation in the seven churches recently, and it referred to one of the cities as being the synagogue of Satan. It was almost like Satan had a headquarters there. 
This was going to be a spiritual battle, a spiritual encounter, and the people had to sanctify themselves to make sure that they were prepared for that. Yes, there was a, a, a material invasion of people going into a new land, but this was also God attacking a spiritual evil. Achan, we're going to read about in, in the next few weeks here, he was a threat, not because he could cause them to lose a physical battle, but the sin of Achan in disobeying God meant they could lose a spiritual battle. And just as the children of Israel were to sanctify themselves, so should we. Let's look for a moment over in 2 Timothy chapter 2. Now, any sanctification in our life is purely by the grace of God. It's something which uh, He enables us to do, but there's a part for us to play. In 2 Timothy 2 verse 22, Paul tells Timothy, Flee also youthful lusts, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace, with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Three things from here I want to mention. Number one, he says, run from sin. If there's a sin that you feel like you are falling to, he says, run from it. Don't try and stand up to it in your own strength. He says, flee youthful lusts. He says, don't even allow sin to be something that you play with and something you think you can control. He says, flee youthful lusts. The second thing is he says, pursue or follow righteousness. And that word for follow, it, it, it could even extend to having the idea of persecuting something. And he means that you need to, to chase after righteousness, to obtain it, you know, something that you want to catch. Uh, the third thing I want to point out from this passage is he says, with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. He says, associate with the people who are going to help you with this. Get alongside the ones who are doing those first two things, who they themselves are fleeing sin, but they're chasing righteousness. Make them your, your, your kind of colleagues and your friends and the ones that you're going through life with. The sanctification process is, is one that is really focused upon the Word of God. In John 17, 17, Jesus praying to the Father says, Sanctify them through thy truth. He says, Thy word is truth. We've been looking at Psalm 119, and we covered the second portion of that, that, of that this past week, or the two weeks ago, where he says, How can a young man cleanse his way? Wherewithal should a young man cleanse his way? by taking heed thereto according to thy word. We need to make sure that we uh, seek God and we want to see him sanctify us in the same way that Israel needed to sanctify themselves because the battle we faced is not physical, it's not carnal, but it's mighty. It's something spiritual and it's the pulling down of strongholds. So seeing that Joshua sought strength for the day, the people had to sanctify themselves. And then finally, I want you to look at how their faith was put into action. In verses 9 through 17, Joshua said unto the children of Israel, Come hither and hear the words of the Lord your God. And Joshua said, Hereby you shall know that the living God is among you, and that he will without fail drive out from before you the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hivites, the Perizzites, the Girgashites, and the Amorites, and the Jebusites. I love that phrase, how he says, without fail. That's confidence in, in the promises of God, to stand before them and say, without fail, all of these groups are going to be driven out before you. There's not much known about some of them. There are historical records for others, but the Hittites, for the longest time, really until the 18th, 19th century, you know, there were people who said, well, the Bible is partly wrong there because there's never been a group called the Hittites. And archaeologists went out and they researched and they found that there not only was a, a people called the Hittites in that area, there was an empire called the Hittites. It wasn't all that long ago that human understanding didn't realize an entire empire existed that stretched all the way up the Mediterranean from Egypt all the way around and then bordered going west again through the Mediterranean into what we now know as Turkey. Humanity compared to the wisdom of God is so limited that we lose entire empires. That should humble us. Have confidence in the word of God. And if you find somebody saying, well, I don't believe the Bible because, number one, there's usually an answer. 
Number two, if you're not sure, give the benefit of the doubt to the Bible because God is to be trusted. When you're not sure, I encourage you, trust the Bible and figure it out later. Ask the questions, do the research, but the answers are there. Joshua says, without fail, God is going to do what he said he would do. They were going to enter the promised land. Canaan was going to be judged for their sin. The plan we find in verse 12. Now therefore take you 12 men out of the tribes of Israel, out of every tribe of man. It shall come to pass as soon as the soles of the feet of the priests that bear the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, shall rest in the waters of Jordan, that the waters of Jordan shall be cut off from the waters that come down from above, and they shall stand upon and heap. One man from each tribe was chosen to come out, and we're going to see more about that in the next chapter. But when the priests would go forwards 3,000 feet before everyone else, and they would step into the water, all of a sudden, it would be dry land. In verse 14, it came to pass when the people removed from their tents to pass over Jordan, and the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant before the people... As they that bear the ark were coming to Jordan, the feet of the priests that bear the ark were dipped in the brim of the water, for Jordan overflowed with all his banks all the time of harvest, that the waters which came down from above stood and rose up upon a heap very far from the city of Adam, that is beside Zaratan, and those that came down toward the sea of the plain, even the salt sea, fell and were cut off, and the people passed over right against Jericho. The river Jordan... You know, God very often, he does things the hard way just to prove that he can. The River Jordan usually would be about 100 feet wide. During the time of harvest, when it was flooded, in portions, we don't know exactly how wide it was here, but in portions, it could be up to a mile wide. Now, I want you to imagine the three days have passed. We've read about that in chapter 2 and 3 somewhat. It's toward the ends of the day, and if you look at the geography of it, the sun would have been set in behind them. Jericho is ahead of them. And they're all stood there by the river. You've got the priests with the ark, and the 12 men from the tribe were somewhere, you know, within distance. And then you had the entire tribe, and however, hundreds of thousands or millions that were there. Beyond, they could see the hills of Canaan. And I wonder if the people of Jericho were looking out on the walls and they were saying, this is crazy. Are they going to swim? Uh, are some boats going to arrive from somewhere? Uh, are they just going to try and cross in and, and then just get washed away? I wonder if they stood there mocking and laughing. I wonder if Rahab looked out of her window and checked to see that the scarlet cord was still there. And she thought... Deliverance is on its way. Hope is about to arrive. As the people of Jericho watch, maybe a small group of men, they notice emerge carrying the ark and they get towards the river and their feet touch the river and as they do, it parts. On the one side that was flowing from the one direction, it stands up on a heap. Psalm 114 is, is one of the psalms we looked at recently as the, the Halal Psalms, the Psalms of Praise. And when you compare that with what's described here, I think it draws an interesting picture. Psalm 114 in verse 5. What eld thee, O thou sea, that thou fleddest? Talking about Jordan, uh, the, the Red Sea. Thou Jordan, that thou wast driven back. Driven back and lifted up onto a heap. And then they all crossed over in Joshua chapter 3. The people passed over right against Jericho. Brave Caleb, who'd wanted to do it 40 years before. Sinful Achan, who perhaps was already beginning to fall away from the Lord. But they all enjoyed the miracle. The priests, so think about them for a moment. They stood in the dry riverbed while the nation passed over on dry ground. They had to have faith. You know, the, the people, it says in verse 17, the priests that bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord stood firm on dry ground in the midst of Jordan. And all the Israelites passed over on dry ground until all the people were passed clean over. You know, it's one thing to look at a river to see the waters had disappeared up that way and it was dry ground. And to say, all right, well, okay, let's do this. You step out on the dry ground and walk over and get the other side and look back and say, huh, we made it. What about the priests who stood in the middle? 
while everyone is passing by around them. They didn't get to get in and then get out. They had to stand there and wait. Pioneer in faith sometimes means that we, we move forward, but sometimes faith means that we wait patiently. And it's all by the grace of God. So for us this evening, in the day in which we live, there is much we can learn of our faith. The priests, the people, and Joshua, they all had a word of instruction from the Lord. And I guarantee you, if you regularly read the Bible, God will instruct you. God was going to do his part, but they were responsible for theirs. And it seems like there were things that God told Joshua that he didn't always pass on to others because it wasn't always something to be passed along. Sometimes God said, Joshua, this is for you. Other times it was something to give to others. I'd encourage you to have a relationship with the Lord like that where, you know, and this is especially true for, for preachers and pastors, that we don't pass along everything. So sometimes God says, you know what, this is for you. And I've, I've done that. I know when I've got something from the Lord and I've been excited about it and I've tried to maybe preach it and nobody else kind of enjoys it the same way I do. And, and it was because God never intended for me to share it with someone else. It was meant to be between me and him. Get something from the Lord for yourself, for yourself. Spend time with him in the word and in prayer. Look at their faith in the way that it either meant they moved forward or they waited patiently until the command to move came. Trust the Lord, whatever the case may be. And realize this as we look at Joshua, at Rahab, at the nation here, that belief is a choice. Courageous faith is a choice. And when we make it, and like those priests, we kind of step out he will do his part. When we step out onto the Jordan and the rivers begin to move, we do our part and God is going to do what he has promised he will do. It's all to his glory. It's all by his grace. But what is God calling you to do? What steps of faith has he put upon your heart? Let's just close with a word of prayer and then we're going to uh, sing a couple of verses of a hymn before we move into uh, observing the Lord's table together this evening. Father in heaven, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the example of Joshua and all that we see in him. Lord, I pray uh, that as we continue now and, and we, we sing uh, verses that speak of your death uh, for us, that we will meditate upon all that you have done, upon the salvation that we receive from you, and we think upon the cross as we partake of the elements that we would consider what they mean of your body being broken and your blood being shed. Lord, we thank you, we praise you now, and we ask for your help. In Jesus' name, amen.